You're listening to the Ryan Go Podcast, starring Ryan Hoger and Ryan Eastwood, and sometimes other people named Ryan. But now, here are some Ryans. Nighttime podcast, spooky nighttime podcast, and the first one where you, where you're on a ship. The first one where I am on a ship. Uh, I think it's also the second one that I've, or no, I think the first one that I've started out tipsy and have another pint of beer. Okay. So, well, (laughs) this should be interesting because yeah, I was gonna say like I don't even know if I'm in the right mindset. Uh, I. I did a little drinking with the family over the last couple of days and I'm kind of just have that like burnt out end of the weekend feel. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what my brain comes up with. I've got, um, I see you're going with more booze. I have mild stimulants <laughs> going on. Um, I think this light is too red. Ooh. A little white. Um, yeah. So you were just telling me what's new. You're you're on a new ship. You had a couple fires, a little oopsies. Little oopsie. <laughs> yeah. Little oopsie Bernie. Little oopsie booty explodey. Yeah. Nobody died. Nobody was hurt. So all is well. Oh, that's good. How long is it going to take to re- rebuild those those generators? They say we're still going to make a July sailing. I am skeptical, but that is what they say. You have... Uh, you have reason to be skeptical. Um, golly gosh, what have I been doing? I've been playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, you've I'm been a, playing Dungeons and Dragons. That's a delightful game. I'm a few. Uh, yeah, I got some dice, y'all. Check these dice out. Oh, my God. What is your class and race? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, check this out. So um, one of Allison's friends' husbands is an ex. Like He's a drama nerd that used to live in L.A., and he's been playing Dungeons Dragons or DMing for like 10 years. So he's super knowledgeable about it and really deep into it. And he was like, yeah, well, we just started this campaign and there's this NPC uh, called Oceanus that's a sea elf and maybe you could be him. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I yeah. will be a sea elf. Sure. Be a sea elf. I kind of already am a sea elf. Yeah. That's the the joy of Dungeons and Dragons is finding a character that that searches into who you really are. Yeah. So is it that or see right now I find that I'm playing, I'm playing the character as basically more or less me, like more or less how I would act in those scenarios. But do you do it that way? Or do you do it kind of the kind of a way where you build an entire like ulterior personality? And then the fun is kind of not being yourself like normally if you're a very passive person you could play somebody who's super aggressive and just like explore those other aspects of of personality i mean it it depends on the game it depends on the character some of my characters are similar to me some of them are not it's it's really fun either way yeah yeah it's it's a good time (laughs) it's really fun both ways (laughs) do you uh do you just play with the kids or do you have um... yeah i haven't played with adults in a long time but i did used to do that I play with the kids and the wife and it's a good time. We're going through a prepackaged module lately. We actually had a neighbor um, at our last house who played with us, with us and the kids. And that was, he was really good. He was a super good neighbor, Robbie. He was a, he was a quality D and D player. And we got some good times out of that. It was nice. Cause with the kids, you don't really like accomplish the goals all that well, but the sessions are actually surprisingly good. Like they, they, they really, play the characters and they get super into it and you end up going on wild tangents and not really accomplishing very much as far as the progression of the storyline but that's that's why D D is fun so much much <laughs> like a child does IR, irl yeah. wild um, tangents yeah i found it to be um thank you oh have, my goodness uh, i found <laughs> my god um <laughs> I found it to be so I'm used to playing sort of like D&D adjacent computer games where, you know, RPGs, you know, whatever. I'm sure everybody listening has like played or heard of Skyrim or there's other different types of RPGs, Baldur's Gate, whatnot. But your stuff where you're like, I have attack stats and I have magic stats and I have defense stats on kind of thing. Um, And the thing about D&D that you just can't replicate is the 
the fact that there is no sure thing whatsoever. Like you can be the best at a thing and you might get a shit dice roll and just your SOL, right? Or you don't exactly know what your other players are going to do. So I felt like most games, I can just figure, I can kind of like get in the minds of the people that made the thing and figure out what the right answer is and feel pretty confident. Like once I get the groove, I'm like, okay, I got this. I got this game figured out. I got, I'm, I'm overpowered. I'm, I'm good to go. I know, I know what they're going for in this quest line or whatever, but not Dungeons and Dragons, man. That's it's like real life. Yeah. Yeah. And the chaos is great. Like I, this last time I was playing with, uh, with the, the kiddos, my oldest, you know, we go into a tavern and it's really vaguely described. It's just that there's somebody there that's going to be able to give you information on your quest or whatever. And my oldest is like, I, is playing a halfling wizard, I think, or a halfling illusionist, something ridiculous like that, something super underpowered. And he's like, I climb on top of a table find the largest tankard of ale that I can and begin singing a song. And I'm like, okay, roll 20 uh, sided dice. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> like how will this, how is this? That's it's great. Cause especially as a DM, you really, you really can't plan too much because you just have no idea. You have no idea what your players are going to do. Just not a clue. <laughs> yeah i can see how it'd be it, that could be extremely frustrating because like we we i think we're being good sports and we're playing along sort of where we're being led a little bit right and then, so then you go into a building and you discover this dude has like just mapped out all this stuff like done hours and hours of work and he's got like we're like i'm gonna steal a letter out of that desk and he's like here's the letter and it's like a real physical letter that he hand wrote out and now we're just like dude Right. But if if somebody if we just went completely on some tangent and avoided all of the work that they did, I can imagine that that would be uh, rather frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I bet I get some money for the, the, the stones that this castle keep is made out of. I hire a wagon and several labor laborers and set them to dismantling the fortress. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good time. Um, I am looking up a. William Wordsworth poem that I meant to have ready already. Um, so while I'm doing this, I'm going to ask you yes or no rapid fire uh, philosophical questions. Um, do you think yeah. that the universe began at the Big Bang? No. Do you think that humans have free will? Maybe. Do you think that you will maintain your consciousness after you die? Uh, in a sense, but not recognizably as anything with my name. Do you think that there is a deity or are deities of any kind as depicted in human religions? Yes. Yes. That one I want more answers on. Which ones? Okay. Uh, I think... It's the sense of, like, not necessarily that they exist as a particular physical being, like, you know, Vishnu, for example, is actually... A, a a blue skin forearmed man that I'm going to meet one day, but that the 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 uh, aspect of Vishnu as a creature that puts on the masks of every person and is like the the drama, uh, sort of the actor that plays the role of every person. Yes, that's a real thing. That's a that's a facet. That's a legitimate facet of existence that actually exists, uh, and is a thing. Yeah, no, I, of any of the God, like the gods or depictions of gods that I have been exposed to. And granted, I have a very like limited knowledge on those things. Um, those Hindu manifestations tend to make a lot of sense to me because they kind of uh, imply the oneness of all things, which is today's topic. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that... <laughs> surprise we do have a topic there is a topic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i actually got talking to the uh, i was visiting with family and got on a, a riff about some of this last night so i think i'll i at least have some stuff to go um nice. in my in my head here um yeah so is it that uh, isn't it that in in hindu philosophy you have these various manifestations and different gods but that they are all just faces and expressions of of the same thing yes uh you know i don't know hinduism in particular well enough to be able to answer that intelligently um i've encountered individual deities 
um, and then sort of seeing them expressed through the universe enough to say uh, that that's a legitimate sort of way of looking at things. But I could not claim to be enough of an expert on Hinduism to say whether that's true or not. Like, I guess I'm asking, do you think it's do you think that that is merely a metaphor? Right. Or like there are legit other conscious entities existing on some other plane that interfere or interact with human affairs in, in one way or another. I definitely would not say that there are not those things. Um, it's interesting even to consider that there are belief system, modern belief systems that are adhered to and followed that that do like fully believe in that like i guess christianity honestly you could probably say does fall that but uh, my wife was uh stayed at a Hare krishna temple for some time and they the core of Hare krishna really is that krishna is a blue-skinned dude playing the flute that lives in an adjacent dimension to our reality and that what you every sort of grief and anger and ill feeling and sort of suffering that exists in our universe exists because you are not doing the thing you're supposed to be doing with your existence, which is praising Krishna. Yeah, like that's what you were supposed to be doing. At some point you were in you were in Krishna's harem, um, spending all your time worshipfully praising Krishna. And then at one point you were like, damn, what if I like had my own free will and wanted to do what I wanted to do instead of what fucking Krishna wanted me to do? Instantly, you're now transported to here, which is basically hell. And what you are supposed <laughs> to do. Che checks out. <laughs> yeah. Theory checks what, out. <laughs> what you do is you have to clear yourself of all your individual wishes and return to your, your actual job, which is telling Krishna that he is the shit. Um, and do I think think that krishna is actually out there i think that it's 50 50 at the least i think he's probably hanging out yeah my pet theory as to the power that these things have and this goes for christianity as well because I, I think this is where a lot of atheists miss the boat with me because I, I i don't think that there's no there there with religion clearly uh at the very least we have to say that there are powerful metaphysical experiences that people are having and that it's very dismissive to just say no that's all hallucinations have a nice day and it's also very dismissive to say any meaning that you derive from this belief system or arrangement also just needs to be put down because you know the various truth claims in your book are demonstrably untrue because of because of science um they seem to be always at getting at the same thing, which is the oneness of things. And these various spiritual paths, by, by giving yourself and your ego up and simply pray, not my will, but yours be done, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, giving up this gradual process of letting go of your ego's own wants and needs and petty desires and just letting that you know, fall away like a snake sloughing off its skin and then merging with this thing that to you is the greater power um, is just an abstracted conceptual layer on top of what is just actually going on, which is that you are an artificially separated little chunk of the universe that is not in fact separated, that is living under the dream and the illusion that you are separated. And that's what your life is. And that any interesting life is the slow merging of yourself back into the oneness of things. And we all get to that same destination in the end with death. But uh, I, th I think to my mind, an interesting life is one where you just you lean into it rather than shy away from it. Like if we're going to say, and that's kind of a Buddhist or Taoist concept, isn't it? That that's, that is sort of the source of suffering is you trying to swim against the current of the river. And in fact, the current of the river is, is your, your, yourself, your greater self that you're, that you're fighting against. So I think anytime you have that greater thing that I'm sub being subservient to, um, that can be 
a spiritual practice that people find very meaningful because it brings them to sort of ego disillusion and, and merging, I guess is how I would summarize it. Okay, so uh, with that, that answer in the forefront, I'm going to roll back a little bit to your previous question and throw it back at you. Do humans have free will? Uh, no. No. Explain. Um, you know, I, I don't think that you can even, once you start to try and even get very pointy about what you mean by free will, uh, people can't really come up with a, with a coherent answer there. Uh, I think the idea of free will comes from uh, something that's really particular to Homo sapiens. It's very useful, which is this idea, if you do something and you screw up, you think to yourself, well, I could have done otherwise, and I will in the future, right? And what that's doing is it's allowing you to evaluate past decisions and actions and turn that into, like, leverage that into better future decisions and actions, okay? Um, but that notion right there that we get latched onto, I could have done otherwise in the moment, um, I don't think, I can't imagine any basis for it. Like, there's no physical basis for that. There's not even a, uni a universe of any sort that you could possibly like. It's it's either one of two things, right? It's either order or order or randomness. Okay, that you choose one thing versus another thing. Um, that's either a pattern playing itself out perfectly, or there's sort of a quantum physics level of total randomness at at a base layer, and and that's not free will either. Um, anybody who's spent any time in meditation enough to notice that the things that we we think are most willful are most our choices that we're making like your thoughts uh those just float into your fucking head they they don't they come out of the darkness into your consciousness they're not chosen by you whom would be choosing such a thing who is the chooser when you start to look for the chooser in a really empirical way uh you you just don't find that they're there so i think my base identity is merely um the consciousness itself the observer and that everything else is mere is, is just happenings within that I don't, I don't think there's any free will so in that do you think that our lives are in fact pre destined at every moment and that we're passive observers and it only appears that we're making decisions or do you think that it's some kind of middle ground there well that's coming from a divided mindset so that's coming from a dualistic mindset right which is um to say that you're a, to say that you're a passive observer and everything else is happening to me well where is the dividing line of self okay so if what is me ends at my skin, well, then, yeah, you're in this world that's doing things mm. that you're subjected to. If what is me ends at consciousness and the contents of consciousness are not me, well, then, yeah, you're just watching a movie, I guess, for all intents and purposes. And, and we might as well say it's, it's deterministic because in that model, you're not even interacting with anything. You're just an observer. But um, in fact, if you if your base identity is that of the entire universe, then that duality between willful action and thing that is happening on its own totally breaks down, and the and the and the question becomes sort of incoherent. Everything is everything is a do happening. It's an action reaction. It's a that 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 con that division gets broken down when you really do realize the oneness of all things and embody a non-dualistic mindset. So here's uh, to bring that to a more, I guess, concrete level. Let's uh, take an example of climate change. Uh, I think scientifically inarguably caused by human activity. Um, is this some, and from a individual point of view, basically it's impossible to, it's almost nearly, if not entirely impossible to do anything about. Are we being carried along by the tide here? Is there absolutely nothing that we can do about it? Are we caught in a sea of decisions that have begun far beyond our existing and will continue far beyond our death? Or is there uh, any purpose in uh, caring? 
Um, hmm. Speaking of the interdependence of all things, since all things are interdependent. I mean, yeah. So the interdependence of all things is really what, what got me. I think I was thinking about the interdependence of things across time and just what a mind fuck that is. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, and that, that's what got me started on this to get away from, you know, just non dualistic philosophy into um, interdependence. But yeah, almost all of these things, and I thought a lot about this, you know, I, I deployed to Afghanistan once and I thought a lot about this in reference to just the war machine. And I, it occurred to me just being immersed in it that none of this is the devious plot of any one individual, but it's, it's, it's like a stock market. It's like a economy as a whole. This is a very complex web of individual cooperating and competing interests like a slime mold, <laughs> all just go interwoven and intermeshed and interacting. I, I don't know that any one person can get their their head wrapped around it. You know, I've wondered that is is just the very the very nature of a human um and our inbuilt incentives sort of doom us to do something like is this too big a problem for our evolution? You know, any other species, given the opportunity, given a total lack of environmental constraints, would take over the, the earth and fucking kill everything. Absolutely. And it, it wouldn't decide to do that. It wouldn't say, you know, it, it, ants wouldn't decide one day, well, I want to destroy the entire earth and make it unlivable for myself. They're just following the fucking programming, man. And I think that's what humans are doing. And the, 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 the aggregate force behind i just want gas to be cheaper so i can drive my kids to baseball and it doesn't cost very much money and all those people make those individual decisions i personally am not terribly uh hopeful that we can get over that now we have solved very large collective action problems we have saved species we have kept the fisheries from being totally overfished like we have gotten to the brink and said whoa and put the brakes on and actually gone against the force of people's individual interests in, in for the sake of the collective good. It has happened. It can happen. And I think in this case, if you're a person that cares about it and, and you're trying to wonder what the framework is, you really don't have a choice other than to try to do something about it. And if that ends up being futile, well, at least, you know, you lived out sort of the, the true motivation that was in your heart. I don't have it very much. <laughs> it's not, that's not my jam that I'm going to devote all my time and, and all, all of my energy to, but you know, uh, anybody that does, uh, God, God bless you. I'll help out. I don't know. Did I, did I answer the question yeah. or did I meander Absolutely. too much there? No, you answer the question. Okay. That's yeah. a good answer. I liked it. So interconnectedness across time. Like, if, oh, no, let's, okay. Let's get on that. Let's get on that. Yeah. So, and this kind of ties into free will because we all sort of bebop around feeling like we have free will. But the just embedded in our language and in our culture are so many concepts, thoughts, ways of viewing things that you're not even conscious of that somebody else put there. The idea of free will, if I'm remembering the philosopher right, somebody check me this, uh, right? Ryan Eastwick at gmail.com for corrections. But I believe it was Aristotle. The salient point is, um, I was listening to a podcast on this the other day, that uh, this was a, free will was an invented concept by a Christian philosopher. And the Christian philosopher was trying to justify evil in the world. And the only way he could do it if God controlled everything was to say, well, then man must have this separate will that's completely independent from the influence of God, right? It, it's separate from the divine will, and that explains the evil. We are the source of that, and that God is the source of every, everything else good. It, it was invented to solve a sort of in, uh, incongruency in Christian philosophy. Now, how many people know that? You know, and we're just walking around with this idea like it's self-evident. Well, it's not self-evident. It wasn't self-evident to people, you know, 2,000 years ago. They didn't think like this. 
Um, there's yep. entire cultures and religions of people that, that, that don't think in this way that we in the West deterministically think of free will. Um, so I, I just think it is just a complete mind fuck to think about the fact that you cannot plumb the depths possibly of your own ignorance as to the number of individual decisions and thoughts and philosophies that have happened over the entirety of human history that have come to build who you think you are as a free agent running about the world. Uh, the, what that immediately leads me to is, uh, the language too, like how your, your ways of thinking about things are so thoroughly shaped by your language and that people who speak several languages are able to see this in a particular way. I don't really, I've got a bit of Japanese, but I can't really say that I am fluent in anything other than English. And actually one that I've heard in particular is that, uh, Arabic is well what i've heard is that it's a very simple language but that there's many concepts in it especially relating to the divine that you really can't express outside of arabic and uh i believe you're an Ar you're an arabic speaker what uh what do you think about that yeah um in their case fatalism like the 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 sense that in fact anti-free will is really built into the language uh, um you know in in shah laws everywhere right so, you know, will you come by on Saturday to fix my plumbing? Inshallah, which just means if if God wills it. I mean, they say it over and over and over again. Um, and that's that's just one. Yeah, as opposed to, yeah, sure, I'll see you Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> or even if you were to say hopefully, like inshallah means yes or or hopefully or never and fuck you. But I'm being too polite to say that to your face. <laughs> that's what yeah, inshallah yeah, means. Yeah. It takes the weight off of your own responsibility as well. And it's deliberately used in that way to say, well, inshallah, well, you know, I, I damn well know that I'm not going to let this guy borrow my truck. But um, if I say inshallah, well, then then God was willing it that way. Way anyway, right? So who, who can come uh. to me and blame me? Yeah, and the usage of it would have so many. Oh, there'd be so much shading of the usage of it, because no. uh, yeah, and that's not the same as saying, yeah, maybe I'll come fix your plumbing on Saturday. You know, maybe. No, that's not it at all. That's putting it back on me. It's a displacement of everything on onto God, which I mean, uh, talk about being really very uh very very different from the western way of thinking of things like we're hyper individualistic hyper you know focused on our own sense of of responsibility um and you know uh, that's how they even approach warfare well it's just charge in screaming guns blazing and uh you know if god's on our side we're gonna win if he's not we're not like wh what is there more to think about so that that uh, now you have less planning and strategy in the sense that if this thing fails, it was because we failed to, to plan. I mean, it infects sort of everything and, and in ways that you can't, uh, hmm. can't imagine, you know, the, the Chinese have a concept of circular time versus linear time, which is not something I'm an expert on, but I think I've heard Alan Watts talk about it. Um, and once you get into circles and cycles of, of time, it just kind of makes you like kind of okay with the status quo. Right. Whereas in the United States, we're just like the new iPhone isn't fucking cool enough. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but it needs to be things need to be different next Tuesday, every Tuesday for, you know, <laughs> until the end of time. And if you have a thing of circular time, you're just like, well, this is just, you know, you don't you don't really pay, give too much credence to peaceful times. You don't give too much credence to war times. This is just another cycle. It's gone on. It's like summer and spring and winter and fall. And uh, yeah. And that's interesting because that um, I feel like that sort of that sort of Asian mindset of circular time, and um, you know the Japan the Zen aspects and a lot of the Buddhist aspects have sort of crossed the pond and started to real at least on the West Coast have really heavily influenced um, our way of thinking here. But I can't really see the well. Maybe I'm off base here, but I can't really see that like idea what you uh, what you were saying about how arabic and the that sort of uh for giving it up to god's plan i can't really see that sort of infiltrating our culture as much i don't know do you see that somewhere uh the, you don't see that 
infiltrating American culture, Western culture. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, American culture, since you know that's where I am. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, especially in in America, we're just so hyper individualistic. I mean, it, it, it the way I I've seen it infect our political realm is acknowledgement of the interdependence of all things um just acknowledgement of our interdependence on each other like uh barack obama was excoriated for saying why we should uh tax billionaires and he said well you didn't build that company right you didn't build that people say you didn't build that they're so indignant oh what does he mean it's that yeah jeff bezos did start amazon and that's provided a lot of value to a lot of people but those trucks drive on roads that somebody else built and there was a civil engineer and there's someone that made the tires and the hubs and those things and each individual you know piston and that it takes we can all act out somebody's vision but it takes so many interdependent factors that the idea that you would then take some of their like enormous amount of wealth that they got and then redistribute just uh, redistribute it throughout society to all of the individuals that did in fact contribute to this project that that seems just to sort of a, a liberal focusing on the interconnectedness of things mindset whereas a more individualistic and, and in this country conservatism just seems to mean hyper focus on individualism um that it, it, it just sits sits totally wrong with them you know Sadly, my internet connection cut out and I missed the full first half of what you said. And the second half sounded very wise, but <laughs> I didn't have any context for it. <laughs> Entire first half. Okay. I'm going to show myself that this is a clip. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that the, uh, could you give a clap to him? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was saying that where I've seen the, sort of differences in the acknowledgement of how interconnected we all are play out in American politics is that uh, uh, Barack Obama was excoriated for saying uh, you didn't build that with reference to Jeff Bezos um, and, okay. and Amazon. Okay. No. I believe it's what he was talking about. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the conservatives said, you didn't build that. How dare you? You know, but what his point was, was I mean, just just think of all the things that need to happen to make Amazon run. The people that make the cardboard, the people that make the streets, the people that are our incredible amount of just intellectual debt that we have to our ancestors to make these things possible. You know what I mean? Like the, so much goes into any one project that is not just the individual CEO at the top. And like, yeah, people get salaries, but the, so the idea that of acknowledging our interdependence on each other in a certain viewpoint justifies, okay, we're going to take some of that wealth from you and we're going to redistribute it to the, the, the society and the legal structure and the whole economic structure that even let you build this thing in the first place. Right. And then conservatives tend to be more, you know, in this country, hyper focused on, on individualism and divisions um such that they they just they they're like morally offended by that by that notion yeah it's astonishing yeah I, I, which is funny since they also the conservative side tends to also really sort of uh uh glorify the achievements of the country as a whole um like what that just got me thinking about is uh like i'm trying to see so, yeah just like even just the highways sorry i was trying to find uh, exactly what the story was here i didn't quite find it but it was cool stuff um that the the freeway system the the freeway system that we all take for granted eisenhower built that in the 1950s and before the 1950s there was not a connected road system for america and that if I recall the story correctly, Eisenhower had to move like his when he was in the army, he had to move his his platoon or his squad or whatever he was in command over over like two states, you know, not that far. And it took him a month or more to make the journey. And at the time he was like, this is bullshit. If I'm ever in the if I'm ever in the position to be able to make it easier to move people and goods from place to place across this huge expanse of 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 wilderness. 
I'm going to do it. And then, you know, spoiler alert, he became president of the United States. And so he was in a position to do it. And then he did it. So now we have this crisscross of freeways and they were only made in the 1950s, 70 years, 75 years, maybe tops. Mm-hmm. And we think of this as like, we, th- I think what, we, what you're probably going, what you're probably going from on this, this whole idea of interdependence through time. We take, we think of this, this freeway system as something that has existed forever, that this is the bedrock upon which American industrialist society is built is this freeway system, the freeways, the truckers, the movement of goods, this system of arteries that the American universe pulses through. It's been around for less than a hundred years, guaranteed, absolutely less than a hundred years, not very long at all. It it's, and then you think about the things like, the foundations of the language that we speak that color the that color everything that we think and that goes back to what the 10th century as english started to turn into as england started to turn into a country that we could vaguely recognize yeah and it goes back (laughs) to the first guy that uh that grunted you know yeah um (laughs) <laughs> and the, the, the I, I just find it like almost spooky, the the depth of that time that's behind us, like um, and then ways that it can creep into our lives that we're not even aware of. Like uh, my grandmother just turned 90 and she uh, she moved here. She's like three and a half hours away. So we drove up to see her. I hadn't seen her in like 10 years. And she was talking about Chattanooga, where I live now. And she goes, oh, your your grandfather, uh, he loved the view from Lookout Mountain. He went through there and he said that he just thought Chattanooga was the most beautiful place in the world. And uh, his dream was to always get a sailboat. And he wanted to sail around the world. And like, that's my goal as well. And it's just like, oh, spooky. <laughs> a little spooky, right? A little, little heebie-jeebies. Um, and so you're just confronted with, oh, wow, there's this person who's dead now in my past. And is that in my genes that came from this person's like own aesthetic preferences and longings just made themselves through God knows what mechanism into me? Because that seems like a hell of a motherfucking coincidence <laughs> to, to have happened. But, you know, what else is going on inside our heads and inside our lives that is us just you know, not being our own free agents, but just playing out the drama and shades of energetic ghosts that are animating, you know, our past and make forcing themselves into the present through our own bodies and and minds. Yeah, that lizard, the just straight up lizard brain saying that looks like food, kill it, eat it. And actually, it's a Kit Kat. But it does look like food. <laughs> you know, like, eat it. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like murdering a candy bar? Yeah, it kind of do. <laughs> I guess that's why you break it in half. You're just like, oh, uh, maybe yeah. that's why it's satisfying. Ah. You're just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it has internal organs. Nougat. <laughs> <laughs> nougat brains <laughs> <laughs> that that trips me out sometimes that we've so smoothly pivoted from like uh harvesting and prepare and hunting and preparing food to recognizing it's when you start thinking about like the weirdness of uh the modern time and sort of how it dovetails into your instincts and what you like that we've that our existence could be so malleable as to accept like I, I had a packaged sandwich from the grocery store today and that I could be like yes inside this plastic bag inside the waxed paper wrapped inside there inside the bread that's inside the wrapper there's meat yeah <laughs> and that this this isn't surprising like- uh, and then how far can you abstract things, right? So you go from like, I want to mate with human woman to I want to mate with, I, I am totally fine with looking at image of human woman somewhere to, okay, 
drawing of human woman is working for me. Okay, yeah. drawing of slightly <laughs> dragon human woman wearing a bikini, which I'm sure exists on the internet. And oh, I mean, like, that's an easy one. <laughs> how how far can we abstract away from our own base instincts and still still have them be triggered? I think the internet wow. is experimenting with that on on all fronts at a million miles an hour. <laughs> Foxtail butt plug. Oh fuck yeah. <laughs> that is hot for I don't know why. Some I don't know deep, why. <laughs> some deep seated gene that's just been along for the ride into my monkey body that that made it here. I want I wonder if cells dividing could be sexy. Just asexual reaper. Or, I guess that would be the you'd have to think hard about the idea of yourself dividing and get like turned on by that. <laughs> is it hard? <laughs> to, get, to get back <laughs> to my way way back ancestors the single celled organisms can the things that turn them on turn me on <laughs> you on. gotta put them you gotta put them in a bikini you know you got the two cells they divide and then they get the bikini and yeah now does it turn into two bikinis or you just get a half a bikini for each <laughs> just half for each one <laughs> for each cell that would only work once my god the interdependence of all things, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> on the right angle. <laughs> I knew we were starting this in a weird mood, man. Oh, my gosh. So, all right. Let's go to the, um, the, the poem that I was reminded of last night because I picked up a uh, literature of nature book that was sitting in my aunt's house. And it had like uh, William Wordsworth was the one that I was checking out. But it's got your, your classics. Um, uh next your... poetry let's go yeah poetry okay <laughs> and this just connects to something that so i had this poem cut out printed it out cut it out put it in the inside of my moleskin notebook because i was a real fucking intellectual and that justifies spending 20 dollars on a, on a tiny notebook um <laughs> the paper's so smooth it's so, it is. It's delightful. It's, it's so <laughs> incredibly smooth um you know, and we would go into what is uh, they called desolation wilderness or the Ansel Adams wilderness of just like gr bare granite, lots of it in uh, in the Sierra Nevadas and go hiking around with my dad as a kid. And that was like incredibly influential to this day. And the way he talks about it, I think is just beautiful. He says, I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is in the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all object of all thought and rolls through all things. And I guess what I loved about that is it's not really, I think this guy was a Christian, but that's not really a Christian notion that the same ineffable force that i sense behind the curtain that is animating the sun and the rays of the sun is also the same thing that's animating my own mind that these two things are are somehow connected um and i really clicked with that as a kid and i but i didn't really like eh, what's the nirvana thing but they don't know what it means i didn't <laughs> i didn't know what it meant i kind of articulated what it meant i was just like oh there's something there it was like this uh uh, God, who talks about that? Um, oh, that's in uh, the book, The Razor's Edge by W. Somerset Mom. And it talks about the main character. And he says that um, it was like he, th this guy leaves home and he goes on a journey and he said he didn't even know what he was going for. It was like some dim star that he was following that he could barely make out behind the cloud cover. And you're just sort of going by faith, but you're just, you, you kind of feel it. And that thing that I was going to, which is really the, the final destination, I think, of all human intellectual and spiritual inquiry is non-dualism, is the total interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. I, I, and I've come to the conclusion to my total satisfaction that there, there is no place else to go. That is the end of the rainbow. So I wonder what, if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, the immediate thought there is that that's uh, the 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 clearing at the end of the path, right there. That uh, that's that's death. You know, once you're once you finish the path, you enter the clearing, and 
that's sort of where you are right there. You, yeah, it's the fi- when you're talking about the final destination, there it is right there. And I don't say that in a negative sense at all. I don't personally really fear death. I feel fear sickness and and uh, crippling instability far more than I fear death. Like death is just being dead. That's being returning to that connection or whatever the hell that that is. Um, yeah. So I guess when you're talking about sort of the final the end up as it is and yeah i'm with you there yeah yeah mm. uh yeah and certain and what's interesting is there are folks that speak of uh who the hell said that i'm not going to remember but some zen types that die while you are while you are yet alive um and that was the goal to get to total non-separation of yourself and everything else. Like think about what that would actually mean. I mean, you'd be dead, but you'd be walking around, right? (laughs) That's, it's very hard to picture, but I've read enough accounts that seem credible that I think some human beings have, have actually achieved that every once in a while throughout time. The, the the immediate thought I have is, uh, you know, there was I I don't know if you heard this story. There was a, a couple of, uh, statue golden statues of zen monks that were found you know whatever 50 100 years ago somebody discovered them and then fairly recently uh these research teams experiment uh investigated them with uh different with uh mri or whatever it was and they found out that there's a monk inside like there's Mm. a there's a there's a fucking person in there and they uh, they talked to the the monks that from the monastery where they found them and they're like, hey, why did you put this dead monk inside like this gold shell? And the monk's immediate response was, they're not dead. Hmm. <laughs> and I guess the process is that. So here's the process, right? That as you, you start eating less and less and less food and in and adding uh, pine needles into your diet so that your pine needles become a significant part of your diet at some point. And you keep eating and eating and eating until your body enters this extremely preserved state. And uh, their firmly held belief is that those monks are not dead, that they have been meditating for something like 400 years inside, inside that shell. Which brings us to the sponsor of today's podcast, Pine Needle Fresh. Pine Needle Fresh will d- deliver... <laughs> deliver boxes of fresh pine needles straight to your door, harvested <laughs> by... Human beings who are paid a living wage wandering through the mountains of California. Uh, they'll deliver them straight to your tour every day. Um, use, the new greatest new diet. <laughs> use, use code RNR at pineneedlefresh.com to get 15% off your first month of self preserving <laughs> eternal life Buddhist monk fucking pine needle. <laughs> so, so it's like the resin gets into your body and then and then they think that you're literally just not dead you're in some sort of state of suspended animation yeah you just continue meditating you mummify while you're still alive he's just meditating wow yeah wow that's a far that's a far out trip man it's pretty far out right (laughs) yeah that is a really far out trip i mean is there a reason to not try to do that well, I I think it, I mean you got to devote your whole life to it. I was, you know, was the one of the um, you know I spent a good amount of time I really pursuing like a week to it, like a week yep, yep. if I was already I, sick and old. <laughs> you know I spent a I spent a pretty good amount of time devoting myself to meditation, and there was a definitely uh some years when I intended to become a monk. Like that was pretty much my highest goal there. And one of the things that really stuck with me at that point was uh. Uh, I think it was one of the Buddhist sayings, actually, that it's very easy to be a monk and it's very difficult to be a householder. And um, that 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 it's really stuck with me that, you know, like we were talking about that whole the uh, the whole. Um, oh, man, I'm a little drunker than I was a few minutes ago, so now it's hard to remember what you're we talking about. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> no, just start just well, speak words, man. Don't think. Yeah, yeah. Just do. Well, we were t- <laughs> We were talking about this a few minutes uh, a few minutes ago about how uh... ah shit it's gone it's gone mm, 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 mm. 
you were talking about well uh, uh, your you know how it's easier to be a householder than a monk no um, much harder much much more difficult i mean yeah sorry the opposite right 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 yeah you know yeah, yeah. i think uh, i i think i get what he's getting at there like uh yeah that you're well i mean you're checking out right you're looking around at the human project and you're going you know yeah no thanks and yeah, it's uh, glorious you know alan watts said that the that the the sort of the purpose of that person in some societies and i think the modern analog honestly is like the van lifer on instagram is it not that we should all do that not that we should all go you know uh, into the hills above the village and and check out but we kind of like that somebody chose to do that maybe it's a an affirmation of our own agency or it's like you're not you don't feel trapped if there's at least one unlocked door in the house you're like well good for that guy <laughs> he went over there he decided to check out of the whole human project i'm not going to do it because i like my kids and my dog but at least it, it like what he's doing kind of affirms my own internal freedom to me like i'm not totally trapped by this thing i could go do that and you know like i said i think the modern the modern analog in america might just be the the carefree van lifer or something and even more so, and I think where like Instagram may become a, a, a true hazard to sort of the, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of try to shy away from social media being a negative along with kind of what we're talking about for about free will and sort of the progression of things and things don't happen for no reason. But I think a, a, a hazard, an actual like hazard um, with the whole interconnected everybody is that more than the van lifer on Instagram it's the van lifer who is not on Instagram, who mm -hmm. is, is really manifesting that. Yeah, true. True. And I've met them, you know? Yeah. I've met people that's just, they're, they're, they're free people, man. And they don't have a retirement account and they don't care. And, you know, you kind of get the sense that they're going to be okay. What am I worrying about? <laughs> it's fucking great, man. It's a glorious way to live. But then once you get dependents, it's no longer an option. I mean, it's an option. Yeah, but it's not. But it's not an option. Many. Option. It's not an option you, you would choose. <laughs> That's just not. Yeah. Let's not throw your own agency out the window there. That's true. Well, what you did say that you were not, uh, did not believe in free will. Yeah. <laughs> correct. But you had, you know, I don't, I don't believe, you know, I'm a non-dualist too, but you must speak in dualist ter dualistic terms and you must speak in terms of choices and, and will. Um, that what becomes one of the mind fucks of greater realization. You're like, oh, I can't be truthful in my language ever. <laughs> there is no such thing as a truly spoken human concept or word. This is all, these are all just tools which facilitate um the shared virtual reality space that we all live in it's all approximations did that just did that, i think I feel like it sounded like a serious stoner there a little bit maybe touch, <laughs> touch. i think this whole podcast sounds like that though yeah well I think it sounds like a drunk person and a tired person talking to each other. <laughs> also <laughs> accurate. <laughs> um, I may be drunk, but at least I'm not tired. <laughs> so, man, another aspect of this that ends up in our political discussion is uh, uh, our interdependence on nature and how we can be completely effing blinded uh, to that <laughs> in our modern civil society. It's like, you think about a city, like uh, when I finally realized this, that kind of blew my mind. Like you, you go somewhere like Los Angeles and everything that's coming in on a truck that came into that place came from nature. It, it had like it at its base level, everything that exists in Manhattan was once a piece of the natural world in in one form or another <laughs> you're like how's it how's it going out there in the natural world given this given this realization it turns out like not so good 
you want to you want something that'll really blow your mind i read a, a mark kurlansky book called the the big oyster and it's all about i don't know if you've read any mark kurlansky he's a delight mm-hmm. he's got he read he writes books about the history of uh foods um mm-hmm. and his delight the 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 sort of the cornerstone ones are one called salt and oh i've seen that cod. okay I've oh, seen it's the salt. so good so good oh mm-hmm. man pick that one up I like love it it will blow your mind how dependent how salt and the trade of because you know today salt is not a big deal because we find it easy to make and distribute but the history of trade and the history of maritime trade is the history of salt production it's astonishing but this one was about new york in particular and new it's in york, the ocean dude there's plenty of salt and people understand yeah, that right <laughs> right that's no actually it took a long time for them to figure that out <laughs> they do now but uh new york and new york harbor was one of the richest natural bounties that has ever existed in the world bar none like you didn't have to work to live in new york like there were just deer and oysters and fish it was overflowing with natural bounty and so it got colonized really heavily and they built a bunch of buildings and they polluted the ocean and now it's pretty much all gone which these books are always really hard for me to read because it's basically just a you know a rundown of how humans have fucked up one of the most incredible natural wonders that have ever existed but new york harbor was second to none it produced enough eat oysters oysters were like the food for everybody in new york and Europe and the rest of America and New York was feeding all of them, New York Harbor, like billions of oysters a year and not anymore. (laughs) And not anymore. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that's why we congregate on the coast, right? Is there's just so much, so so much much food that's just there. It's just on the beach. Like when I was in New Zealand, there's these I'd seen them in uh, American restaurants on uh, New Zealand green mussels and they're really expensive. Um, and you go to the beach there. And it's just like they're, they're just on the beach. They're just everywhere. There's just things yeah. that aren't even going to fucking fight you. You just need you just, you just need a, uh, you know, up. <laughs> a nice pair of pliers or crowbar. And there you go. Yeah, it turns out we're an egg specs predator. These things have no chance. Yeah, <laughs> it's where I think we're at, we're truly at a unique point place in history when it comes to testing our interdependence on nature is uh you you know you you tap new york harbor and where do you go well you just go to the next place okay you go further west right um you go you go to the next thing the next thing and like there is no next thing and i think that like elon musk delusion that mars is the next thing is is just that it's a total delusion like yeah, look, that, we can go to this barren wasteland, yeah. billions of miles away. <laughs> that is an irradiated like death rock. That no way in hell are we going to actually be able to uh, colonize. You know, anytime this millennium um, as a secondary option, which is why like uh, what's it? Um, Don't look up was so right to satirize exactly that fantasy, right? That these these rich assholes just think well you know we'll be okay because we'll just go on to whatever the next thing is because that's what they've done throughout all of human history is they rape and pillage um you know and then they land on some planet get eaten eaten by the uh the well half of them die on the way there and then they get eaten by the strange indigenous things but i i think that's even a an optimistic scenario that you could find some sort of plausibly life-supporting planet like no guys this is this is it sorry uh yep. was also watching the only the one documentary on george carlin recently and he was like oh don't worry about the earth the earth is going to be fine she's going to be around she'll be just fine it's you people <laughs> we are not going to be fine and that is going to be that's i think kind of the next step in our discussing the interdependence of all things through time is uh I appreciate your next? commitment to the continuity of them yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i appreciate it. I, I i that's what i'm good at is finding the threads of a single topic through things that appear to be different but i really do think that that's that's probably the next step of it is okay so here's all these things um these things will continue where do we go from here um you know what was terence mckenna's idea that that uh 
technology would turn into micro technology and that our perfect symbiosis with technology would would uh be consummated and that that would sort of be the thing that allows us to move into the into the next step i i, I don't see any signs of that happening around me sorry terrence but um certain our interdependence with with technology is here to stay and that's a complete you know mind fuck um gosh what was i i was talking with some kids on online on a reddit about um steve jobs had this idea that certain technologies were like inevitable i wonder what you think about this so he was like certain things that come along are just inevitable he's like 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 the manual like the automatic transmission like as soon as you had a car and there was a transmission the automatic transmission somebody was going to invent that right you couldn't sure. you couldn't make that. a law to stop people from doing it it was just going to happen okay and so yep. How he, how he tried to design the products was he kind of saw things that way, which was like the iPhone is one of those things. Like look, they, they've all they all our phones have come to resemble just this one shape of thing, you know, a rectangular deal with a with a screen on the front and some sensors, right? And in that sense, like, is are we willfully designing technology, or are we just like a wet bootloader for this stuff? And it has its own momentum, its own agency, its own evolutionary path. Not that we are making it as inventors, but that like certain things, like it wasn't as soon as they invented the fucking telegram, what we're doing right now on Zoom was inevitable given enough time, right? That was just the next extension of this thing. And it's just going to happen. So do you, do you think technology is sort of inevitable and evolving in the same way that, that life forms and viruses and tectonic plates also have their own evolutionary paths? Oh, 100%. Uh, I mean, I don't know if how much you've actually looked at like, and I, I'm certainly not in any sort of accusatory way, but I don't know how much you've actually looked at like the artwork that I've been making this last couple of years, but that's yeah, literally right. the only thing it's been about. Uh, this is evolution. Oh, like, yeah. And that's, I don't, I don't even know that mind. I don't even know that we even exist as individuals. I think we're actually just servicers for these machines that exist. Uh, we're just the meat parts. Um, yeah, I think that the, the technology and the boat that I'm on right now, arguably is the life form. And again, we're just the meat parts that service it and keep it running. Yeah. 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 You, you said something about the, uh, the, the, the highway system and the arteries pumping. And I was going to mention your, your art there or plug it because it's it, your art is, is exactly that. It's that sort of we are we are the cells pumping through this thing you know who I, I think you've seen these movies right um who the hell made them i can't remember um there's a series of them starting with nakoi katsi and then oh, koyanis you, katsi yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and then baraka and that filmmaker um is so good so these films if if you haven't seen them um they are sort of abstract wordless films you're just it, it's it's all shot in that really large format 70 millimeter IMAX wide shot thing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he shows humans bustling around cities and things like this. And he'll go to factories and he'll speed the footage up and he'll slow the footage down. And it's a lot of this repetitive motions of all the things that we go through. And he's really trying to pull out and show you what your environment is and i've i heard him talking about this in an interview so i'm not just like speculating as to what his thought was but it's that he really wanted to show that no human you live in a technology is your environment if, you, if now as a, as a human if you really think about it you are completely you are not part of the natural world in the same way that anything else has been, has been part of the natural world um and you're you're arguably just like an ant an anthill or a cell inside the organism just following your own routine like you're, you're kind of tiny and, and not that special but he does he does he shows it in this absolutely beautiful way with incredible music and incredible cinematography yeah yeah i, I only ever remembered that philip glass was involved with that apparently the guy was jeff godfrey reggio but mm. i always remember that it was philip glass because the soundtrack is so good yeah yeah i can never get allison to my girlfriend to sit down and actually watch one of those because it does take some 
some patients or I don't know, maybe a decent amount of psychoactive drugs. Yeah, smoke some weed first. <laughs> smoke some weed. <laughs> Not that I condone anything of that nature. <laughs> Only in states and places where it's legal. Should you contemplate doing that in responsible amounts? Responsible amounts. Actually, a slightly irresponsible amount would be uh, ideal for. If only you can get drunk. Does is there any art that like being drunk makes better? Ooh, other than dude, that's a whole that's a whole episode. Yeah. <laughs> other than like the shitty grungy music at the bar is suddenly you're tapping your foot to it and you're kind of, you're actually like yeah, actually this isn't that bad but it's just, this it's isn't garbage. bad but it's actually really bad yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually really bad. I don't think there's any movies that I've ever said to somebody like, yeah, you should really, you should really like get drunk before you watch this movie. That really enhances the experience. Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler movies. Yeah. Uh, Drinking games are another factor though. Hmm. Drinking and physical activities. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. And like movie drinking games. I remember in uh, 2000, I think it was in, yeah, it must have been in 2000. Yeah, it was in 2004 in San Francisco. Me and Charlie had a uh, a drinking game at the State of the Union. Maybe it was 2003 when George W. Bush was doing the State of the Union address and we took a shot every time he invoked 9-11. Oh, God, you must have, you must have <laughs> gone to the hospital. I don't know how I survived that night. Um, if you're going, if you're going to go see the new Top Gun movie, which I did recently, uh, take a drink every time um, someone says "Talk to me, Goose," and you will be you will be in a nice stage <laughs> Good by stage. the end of that All film. Right. What What would be the Riangle podcast drinking game? I have to think about that one. Um, oh, hold on, Louie. Every yeah. time so it's hold on. Well, the thing you said earlier. Anytime we sort of coyly mention marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good one. <laughs> that could be one. <laughs> Plausibly, deniably. <laughs> anytime I forget marijuana. the uh, anytime I forget the source of a quote I'm bringing up, <laughs> that would be yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that'd be a good one. <laughs> That would inter- end too well. Yeah. You know, it's the weirdest thing now. We can reasonably well, assume that more than just us will ever listen to this. Uh, I don't think that's an assumption. I think that's an empirical fact based on yeah, it's bizarre actual data. <laughs> uh, I'd like to give a shout out to everybody who's actually listened to this. We appreciate your attention. Yes, thank you. Uh, Melanie, Charlie specifically have been giving us good feedback. I've heard your feedback on, for some reason, when we're doing the podcast, your audio level sounds exactly like mine, but people have said that you're too quiet. So I've heard you. I'm going to go in there and uh, and mindfully edit this, and I hope it works. And uh, I've been making sure to put my, <clears throat> my, face, my face closer to the mic, which I think may be the entirety of it so if it comes gark, out gark part of your mouth talk like this blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. just reminded me of that apex twin video yeah, that's probably too obscure a reference the window liquor one window liquor <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 blah. god i miss that shit <laughs> it's a great shit <laughs> god the 90s got so fucking weird it was awesome <laughs> when 90s were amazing man. the 90s, were the so 90s will dark. never come again <sighs> Oh. <laughs> have we not gotten that weird and dark? I just get the feeling that we're not like we were creative about our angst at a certain point. We're, we're just like Starbucks and track homes, man. Fuck this. I'm making crazy music videos. Uh, and now we're just like, I'm so tired. I just can't. <laughs> so tired. I can't even yeah. bother to rebel or satirize or anything. We all just sort of make little chuckly jokes to each other about how the ship is sinking and we're all going down with it <laughs> at this point. Yeah. But is that true? Okay, so I'm going to get uh, I'm going to go circle back around to my rapid fire philosophical questions. Do oh, you, oh shit, here we go. Do you think, well this is one I want to know your opinion on. Do you, uh, predictions for the future really. Do you think that um, I guess it's get us into whether or not things are inevitable. Um 
do you think that the human species persists in perpetuity on this planet? Uh, so that's a, that's a yes or no. Do you think we're going to make this place inhabitable and kill off our own species, uh, uninhabitable and kill off our own species? And if not, what what does that look like? Does it look like a fairly large human population or does that look like, you know, we go back to sticks and rocks? For a long yes, time. I think I think we'll continue. I don't I don't actually have really any doubt about that. I think the the state of what that looks like is going to be shockingly, perhaps shockingly different from what we exist now. But in a previous episode, I think we had discussed yeah. how a, how huge of a response um, the human race had to the potential of one in a hundred people dying from COVID, like. And deservedly so, that that would be a catastrophe, that if we are obviously and clearly faced with climate change or, you know, whatever other existential threat, reducing the population by 10%, like that, that the people will not accept that, that they will, in fact, accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished to continue i short of cat of nuclear war which is a big even one then, that's not which is a big one uh, it's, it's that's big one. very possible and would be very very bad i i i even don't, then though i don't think we'd be extinct no see i don't think nuclear war could kill everybody but i think it could set us back uh quite a ways <laughs> quite we're pretty a ways. tenacious we're pretty yeah. tenacious you know You'd ha- in order for us to get to turn into like a uh, go back to a pre technological society, you kind of have to blow up all the information as well. And th- with, ha- with how dispersed everything is on cloud storage and just libraries full of books all over the world, like we might have to repeat the last, but most of the technology that we built was really just the last 100, 200 years. So even if we had to reset, back to you know 1800 and redo that 200 years of progress um you know that's a blip that's nothing that's a blip exactly and exactly and i'm no i'm not really worried about humans being wiped off the face of the earth i think we're gonna be around for a good long time i'm gonna try to adopt that and i don't know why i care like why do i give a fuck like <laughs> my my sort of detached uh you know if you think they don't have free will my sort of detached um mindset is that of like space-time tourist of just like whoa i'm here at a i'm in a really wacky place at a really wacky time neat which is why i think i'm most likely in some sort of total recall scenario where you know i entered a simulator somewhere and they said where do you want to go and i would be like oh i want to be at the peak of human population and civilization on earth that sounds like a a really wacky time to be alive let's let's do that because like what are the chances just what are the fucking chances that you're alive now in this place it's just it's just bananas and then you see but then you see like the the this the research projects that pop up like you know i i follow reddit sometimes and i know not all not all of this will come to fruition but you come to stuff like okay somebody came up with a with basically a gel that you can make a bag out of that you can wave around like basically you know kind of swoop around in the air in like fully arid deserts and you can pull like a gallon of water per per day out of the air with like a plastic bag worth of this stuff and it's cheap to make like, you have to you swoop it around it. over your head for a day <laughs> yeah you just like whoop 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 for 20 minutes or whatever and you can make like a couple gallons of water out of it it just grabs it, it out of the air you would very quickly figure out a way to put like put that on a some sort of self-spinning pole device right? <laughs> exactly exactly and so you hear about that like technology is progress like i'm not really a technocrat but technology is at this point is progressing so rapidly stuff like battery technology is advancing in leaps and bounds um honestly my firmly held belief is that we're going to meet the challenges that we have right now yeah and you know even though if the physical technology goes away there's this idea of like mental technologies that we have so take for example the the idea of a map 
right? You can go back far enough in human history where nobody had the concept of a map. Like I can, I can use abstract symbols on the ground with a stick or on a piece of paper or whatever in order to form a map, or even I can form a mental map in my own head of the, of the terrain. Like once you have that and you've, you grokked it like that that's part of human technology Rock. in a sense right or, or math like even th- think about how much work we don't like even if all the people that understand very very advanced forms of math uh die off well there's enough of us that remember some basic addition subtraction algebra and calculus to where we can we can rebuild in probably very short order because we've got the foundations there distributed throughout the human wetware so that would be very very uh difficult to extinguish if your life depends on it you can do a whole lot uh i probably couldn't how fast do you think i could learn to juggle five balls simultaneously if my life was threatened a year fuck (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well i hope i never end up in that incredibly bizarre situation gun to your head every when day I, when i come back here you better be juggling boy or you're gonna see the butt of my 12 gauge <laughs> just someone that's incredibly angry there aren't enough jugglers in the world <laughs> Wasn't there? There was a movie like that, right? That was trying to prove to somebody that they they had more capabilities than they realized because they they put a threat to their life. What the fuck was that? Anyway, Transformers, Transformers, Transformers. That's the one. (laughs) (laughs) A tale for the ages, a timeless classic. What is your hat? This will be good audio. But what what on earth is on your head? Oh, it's a head tube. I wear these all the time. It's just a tube. It's got a pattern on it. That's a neck scarf, um, isn't it? Uh, it is. It's an, it is a neck scarf. A gator, they call them. I get, oh, it's a gator that is. It's a gator that's on your head. Yeah, exactly. Does it, ha- it, it depi- head. Is, is it depicting something that looks like a, sh- tent- a tentacle? It's got tentacles. I'll show you. It's pretty cool. I'll sh- so I'll show all our audio listeners too. Yeah, all it's you a podcasters. Blue, it's a blue thing on his head with like a kraken. It looks like the Kraken is enveloping his head, like the like the Demogorgon from uh, it's, from Stranger Things. Okay, it's pretty sweet, right? I like yeah. a lot. I've got like six of them. <laughs> I've got a safety yellow one for when I'm working. Yeah, I've actually got two. Oh, I need one. I'm about to go to freaking Beaumont, Texas, and South Florida in Ooh. July. Oh, that's gnarly. Yeah, oh, it's, Beaumont. Ugh. And it's a little gnarly so that I can deliver yeah. premium gasoline so that people can drive their SUVs around South Florida and cut people off. Um, yeah. I'm going to try not to catch on fire. <laughs> Trying not to catch on fire. Stop, drop, and roll, dude. That's all you need to know. What I got. Like, you don't even need fire stick. extinguishers, really, if you just put pace stop drop and roll uh all over the boat take muster take a positive muster take a positive muster (laughs) all right i think we've descended into nonsense um i I think we have (laughs) oh it's good it's good to talk to you man it's been uh it's been too long yes it's been too long it's been a minute i'm glad your your wi-fi is good on there hopefully it is the same uh when you go back to to see you and I think it's be- supposed. To, I think it's supposed to be pretty good. I think it's yeah. supposed to be pretty good. My understanding, if we start tank, taking up too much bandwidth, they'll get mad about that. About that. But as long as I watch my timing, I think actually it's a. Uh, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, they're supposed to be installing one on the Crowley boats, where it's like the basic service is pretty slow, but you can pay for good bandwidth. So depending on what the price is, you know, I could pay for a couple hours worth of like video bandwidth or something, um, and then we might be able to squeeze one in. Well, I'm at work and noise permitting. That's always the thing when, when you're underway. Yeah. We'd have of to course. give that we'd have to give that a shot. But you know, I'm same here too. Import or something like that. Well, um great. Hopefully by this time everybody listened to the the previous episode with Ryan Moser. And I think we are, yes, in fact, we've agreed that uh I would love to keep the all Ryan's thing going, but there's just too many p- interesting people on earth that are not named Ryan. Um, so we do have some guests coming up that uh, are not are not named Ryan to talk about some 
topics that we're excited about. So, but we do uh, also have a guest coming up that is named Ryan, and we have another one coming. It's just, <laughs> Ryan's when possible is what's going on right now. You know, it's COVID. Um, most Ryans are made in China, as people know, and the <laughs> intermodal transportation system is they're they're sitting in containers off of Los Angeles. It's very hard to get a Ryan really unless unless you want to pay to have one flown over, and that's just very difficult. Uh, our budgets are limited. Yeah, <laughs> extremely. <laughs> Speaking of, I need to cancel the Zoom that I paid for to have one other person on here oh, no. for this month. Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> the podcast costs money. Uh, remember remember the sponsor, um, whatever I made up. Uh... <laughs> Pine's all. Pine, Pine Needle Fresh. Yes, that's all. <laughs> Pine Needle Fresh. Um, all right, brother. Well, all you funky people, uh, stay weird. And uh, I hope your life is just strange enough to be amusing. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Ryangle Podcast. Our music is by Talak, T-A-L-L-A-C. For more by Talak, visit soundcloud.com slash Talak.